What's up? Thanks so much for checking out this message today. Our church is in a series titled Mosaic, where we are uncovering the unique pieces of Jesus' character. We hope that this message today helps you see that there's more to Jesus than meets the eye. Before you go, make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you can get the most up-to-date Elevate City content. And if this message has blessed you, feel free to give in the link below so that this message can get in front of more people. Thanks so much. Hope you enjoy. Hey, well, if you are new to the conversation, we're in a series of messages right now called Mosaic. Let me hear y'all say Mosaic. 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 And the whole idea of this series is that there is more to Jesus than meets the eye. See, we've realized that sometimes just um, in our way of life today, it can be very easy for our view of who Jesus is to become very small and kind of limited. But through this series, what we want to do is we want to open our eyes to see that Jesus is far more beautiful and far more dynamic than we have ever even realized. And um, so throughout this series on week one, we looked at Jesus as the son of man. And then we looked at Jesus as rabbi. And then we looked at Jesus as the lamb of God. And we looked at Jesus as the king of kings and lord of lords, like we just sang about. Come on, wasn't that epic? That was awesome. And then last week, Pastor Joey brought a message on Jesus, the friend of sinners. And let me just tell you, if you have missed any weeks of this series, you need to go back on our YouTube channel and you need to check them out because this series has, I don't know about you guys, but my affection and my love for Jesus has just come just alive in this series. And so I'm super grateful for how Jesus has been speaking to us through his word. And so make sure, go back, check that out. Um, today's message is all about one of Jesus' names that was prophesied about him uh, long before he ever came as a baby. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as she considered these, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Someone say that with me. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. If you're taking notes, I want you to write. There's, if you're not taking notes, there are note cards on your seat. I want you to write at the top, Emmanuel, God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. Now I need to preface this message this morning by saying that yes, this is the story of Christmas. But I need you to know that this is not just The story of Christmas. Emmanuel. See, I believe that one of the reasons why Christmas time can be filled with so much joy, with so much joy in our hearts, is because we are reminded that the God of heaven stepped down into his creation, the world that he created, to be with his people. And that gives us great joy in this season just to know that he is near. We're reminded of that. That's why we say this is the most wonderful time of the year. That's why we sing songs like Joy to the World. It's why we give gifts. It's why we gather together with friends and feast on ham. It's why we put stars above our Christmas trees. It's why we sing the songs we sing. It's why we have this sense of just joy. It's because we are reminded of the reality that God is near. But the problem is that we seem to see Emmanuel many times as just a seasonal banner to hang over our mantles rather than an everyday message for us to joyfully embrace. See, I want you to think for just a second, like when's the last spring or summer that you just get caught up singing, Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Like when's the last time in July you're just like, you know what, Emmanuel, God is with us. Like that doesn't happen very on, very often if we're honest. 
Like how often does this word Emmanuel just come off the, off the tip of our tongue and just get spoken amongst friends and with family members as we're just talking about Jesus? How often do we think of him and see him as Emmanuel? God is with us. See, the meaning of Christmas is not just for December. It's a message that we need every single day. In every season of our lives, we need to be reminded of the reality that God has come to be with us. See, the Emmanuel is the story of Jesus stepping into your story to walk with you in and through every season and every journey that you face in this life. It's the story of God leaving heaven and coming to walk with his creation so that they would never have to walk alone. And so, my friend, I need you to know today that we need God to be with us. We need God to be with us. We need help in this life. We need help battling darkness. We need help finding joy in the midst of struggles. We need help making decisions. Like, heck, most of us, we needed help this morning just figuring out what to wear to church. Am I right? That can be a hard decision. Uh, We need help finding purpose and meaning and satisfaction. We need help making sense of all that's happening around us. And whether you realize it or not, you need God. We are all sin-stained, selfish, and we are struggling. And the world would love for you to believe that you can do this life thing on your own. That deep down in you is everything that you need to succeed. But if we're honest, like, that's clearly not the truth. You're not enough. I am not enough. But the good news of Jesus is that he is more than enough. You need the peace that Jesus promises. You need the constant and unchanging love that he has to offer you. You need the power that his presence can give you. You need the freedom. You need the freedom that knowing God is with you can bring to your anxious and worrying thoughts. You need God to be with you. See, God is the only one who is constant, who promises to never leave you or forsake you. And when everyone else will eventually let you down, he will never fail you. His goodness knows no end. And even when it's hard to see it, God is working. He is always working and moving. And even when it's hard to notice his nearness, the Christmas story is a reminder that he is close today and he's close tomorrow. See, God's presence is not just a prop for your annual Christmas celebration. It is the power of God working with you in your every day. And so let's talk about this name, Emmanuel. The name given to Jesus, Emmanuel, or with an E in the Greek, Emmanuel, appears only three times in the Bible. And the first time that we hear of this name is in Isaiah 7. And the next time is in Isaiah 8 and then in Matthew 1, like we just read. And we're going to be looking at Isaiah 7 for just a moment. Isaiah 7, 14. This is the prophet Isaiah prophesying. And he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. See, in the book of Isaiah, a child was to be born in the time of King Ahaz, and that child was to be given the name Emmanuel, and it was to be for uh, the people of God a sign, a reminder, hey, that I am with you, that God is near, that God is close. And so, side note, if, if you're new to the story of God's people, God's people were almost always under attack by other nations. Everyone was after them. No one understood why they did the things that they did, why they had the land that they had. And so everyone wanted to take them over. Everyone wanted to conquer God's people and overthrow God's people. And so in the middle of these attacks that they're facing from Syria, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz. And he says, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to give you this reminder that I am with you. And you will see a son to be born named Emmanuel. And so Isaiah was prophesying about a child to be born in that day, but this was also a messianic prophecy that that Mary, there would be a virgin born to Mary, and it would be the birth of King Jesus. And so God's people are under attack. God sends King Ahaz a sign. He says, I got you. I will be with you. Listen, I need you to know today that just as those words were spoken to King Ahaz 2,800 years ago, those words are still echoing true in our lives today. That in the middle of whatever battle that you're facing, in the middle of whatever siege seems to be stealing your joy, God is still speaking today and he's saying, I am with you. For the one who struggled just to get out of bed this morning and make it here, he's saying, I have come to be 
with you. For the young professional who seems to have hit a wall in their career and calling and is struggling trying to navigate what is next, God has come to be with you. For the single and searching, the one wondering how long is this season going to last and when will it be over, God has come to be with you. You are not alone. For the mom that's trying to make sure that everyone gets all their presents for Christmas, buying everyone else's presents, getting them all wrapped, buying herself presents, making sure that they make it under the tree, all while working and taking care of everyone else, God is with you. He sees you. He has come to be with you. For the woman battling infertility, God has come to be with you. For the man questioning his purpose and value, for the one striving to succeed, for the anxious and depressed, for the doubter and the one asking questions, for those experiencing the loss of a loved one, God has come to be with you. And I don't know what the mosaic of this year has looked like for you, but maybe you've had a a rough year. Maybe for you, when you think about the mosaic of this year, you see God is frustrated with me or God is far from me or God has forgotten me. Maybe that's how you look back and see this year. But what I need you to know is that Christmas is the ultimate declaration that God is with me. It's an infant making an infinite statement that we never have to walk alone. It's Jesus coming to walk with us through whatever we walk through. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 145 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. See, Emmanuel is not just a word that we sing about in December and then forget. Like it is a 24-7, 365 day a year truth that we need to embrace and walk with the reality that God has come to be with us. And so I just want to ask you, like, when's the last time you thought about that? The nearness of God, that God would step into creation. Like for so many of us, we don't meditate on the nearness of God. Like when our lives get hectic and when it gets busy and challenging and we're going through trials, what do we try to do? We try to fix everything ourselves. We try to take care of it. Or we isolate ourselves, we step back, we try to maybe distract ourselves or fill our minds with something else. We try to just cram as much Netflix garbage into our minds and just hope that everything's going to be okay. Or, Or you're the kind of person that's like, you know what, I got this. I'll just pull myself up. I'll just take care of things. You know what, I can figure this out. But isn't that just a big lie? We can't do this life on our own. We need God to be with us, and we need to remember that he is near. Let's look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the word, being Jesus, Jesus is the word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, the word was with God, but now the word is with us. That's what theologians call the incarnation, that Jesus would take on human form, or as Pastor Joey says, that God would put on a skin suit, and he would be born of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit to be with us. And so we've got to understand first, though, that we were created to be with God. We were created to be close to God. But we messed that up because of our sin. We could not draw close to God. And so Jesus comes as the image of God to bring us back to God. In Colossians 1.19 it says, For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And so think about it. In the Old Testament God would dwell in tents and the tabernacle and in the temple. And he would dwell as a cloud over Mount Sinai. And a lot of times what we see is his, his dwelling was contained. He was contained to one specific place at a time. But in Jesus the fullness of God has come to be with us because we were unable to be with God. And so what other God would leave their throne and step into the earth that they created? There is no one like our God. Remember back to the message of Son of Man? Jesus became flesh. He was tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet he was sinless in every way. Remember the message on the Lamb of God? Jesus had to become flesh 
in, in order to, be, to die to be the payment for our sins so that we could be forgiven and for us to know God. See, Jesus is the greatest Christmas gift ever because he put himself into flesh and blood to be present with us. Emmanuel is God with us, the word with us, the creator with us, the king among us, the author of life right in front of us. And so Jesus takes on flesh and becomes a man to die so that he could be near his people. This idea of dwelt among us, this is the image of God pitching a tent with his people. It's like the God of the universe says, hey, I want to come camp out with my creation. I want to come and be close with you so that you can have access to me. I love one of my favorite things um, during the week is whenever I get home from work and I walk into the door and you can immediately hear my kids start to scream, dad. And they start running towards me. And um, one of my favorite things is they just want to hug me right away. And so they'll start trying to hug me. And if I don't get low to hug them, they'll just end up just like hugging my leg. Have you ever seen that before? Just like a kid just grabbing someone's leg. And, and so what I do every time is I try to drop whatever's in my hands and I try to get low so that I can hug my kids. Because what kind of dad would I be if I was always just like, okay, yeah, okay, hi, you can hug my leg, here you go. Like, that's weird. No, like, I would be a terrible d dad, but I need to get low to be with my kids. Like, in our kids' playroom, we have these two chairs, and I don't even know why they're in there because we never really sit in them, but they're two grown-up adult chairs in the kids' playroom, and, um, but we never sit in them because why? Like, I don't want to sit in a chair when I'm with my kids and look down at my kids. And watch them play. I don't want to sit up high and look down. No, I want to get low with my kids. I want to get on the ground in their mess. I want to see the perspective that they have. I want to feel the toys that they're playing with. I want to grab the magnetic blocks and build a tower and a spaceship with my son. I want to sit on the multicolored chevron rug in the middle of all of their graham cracker crumbs and nastiness. I want to sit. I want to get low with them so that they can be with me and so that I can be with them. I need to be close enough for my kids to wipe their snotty noses on my shirt. I need to be close to them. And this is what God has done with us. He has come to be near. He is not looking down at us. He has come close to us. He is drawn near so that we can know him. See, God is not afraid of the crumbs of your life. He is not bothered by the stench of your shame. He knows your filth. He knows your mess. And yet he has come to be close. See, the point of Christmas is proximity with God. It's proximity with God that the God of the universe would leave his chair, get down into the muck and the mess of our everyday. I love how Eugene Peterson puts in John chapter 1 in the message, says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Moved into the neighborhood. Let me give you a little perspective of the kind of neighborhood that Jesus was moving into. See, in 175 B.C., amid social and political unrest, sound a little familiar, a new ruler, Antiochus IV, ascended to the throne of Greco-Syria. Antiochus was a Greek Hellenistic king. He took on the title Epiphanes, which means God manifest. But the people of the day, they just called him the madman. And he was a madman. He was on a conquest to conquer Egypt. He, he wanted to gain a larger kingdom than Rome. He wanted to try and even resist the Roman Empire. And so um, when he got to Israel, though, he was met with this resistance and rebellion. He's trying to make his way up there. And in response to that, he said, nope, you guys want to resist? Okay. And um, Antiochus IV slaughtered thousands of people in Jerusalem. He outlawed Judaism completely. He went on a rampage to wipe out the Jewish people entirely. He overtook the temple. He placed the statue of Zeus in the middle of God's holy temple to be worshipped. He forced priests by penalty of death to eat pork, which for them is an unclean animal. He performed sadistic reverse circumcisions. And most notoriously, Antiochus entered the Holy of Holies and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. Terrible. The Jews had had enough. Eventually, they led a revolt to overthrow him. Um, but their freedom was short-lived because Rome then moved in. Rome marched in, squashed their rebellion. And this time, Herod takes over, and he was appointed king of the Jews. And if you know the story of how that goes, Herod wasn't much better. Herod, when he heard that another king was to be born, he ordered the slaughter of every son, every male boy under the age of two to be slaughtered. 
Can you imagine what the Hebrew people must have been feeling up to this point? Can you imagine how they might have felt abandoned and all alone? But God was working. God was working. See, little did Herod know that he would set the stage for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. And all of these things were paving the road for God to move into the neighborhood. See, what's incredible about Emmanuel is that God didn't pick the pristine neighborhood with well-kept lawns and sidewalks and a nice HOA to move into. No, 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 no. God moved into the run-down, dangerous, chain-link fence kind of neighborhood with sirens blaring, wrong side of the tracks. God moved into the mess. This was the place, this was the season, and this was the neighborhood that Jesus is moving into. A people with a broken past, a grieving present, and a very uncertain future. This is God with us in our mess. This is God showing his faithfulness with his people and us in the most intimate way possible that Jesus would move into the neighborhood. See, the beauty of the Christmas story is that Jesus is stepping into your story no matter what your story looks like. Like, have you ever wondered maybe if your life was just a little too messy, a little too dirty, a little too sinful for God to be a part of, for God to want to move in? I need you to know that there is no neighborhood that's too far for God to move into. And if God would step into the mess of first century Israel, then how dare anyone say today that he's done with us in 2021? God's not done with us. This is nothing to him. He is still moving and working. See, no matter the pain of your past, the things that were done to you, or maybe the things that you have done, Jesus has come to meet you where you are. No matter the struggle of your today, no matter the heartache and heartbreak, Jesus has come to meet you where you are. No matter the failures in your future, because there will be many, Jesus will never stop coming to meet you where you are. In John chapter 8, we see this story of Emmanuel coming to meet messy people where they are. And at the beginning of the chapter, we see a group of people dispersed to go to their homes. But then Jesus, he ends up going up to the Mount of Olives. And it can be assumed to spend time with his father. But then in the morning, he goes to the temple to be with some messy people. And so Jesus sits down with the people and, the, and people gather around with him. And he begins to teach. And as he's teaching these religious leaders, they bring to him a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And so they bring her before Jesus and uh, in this attempt to expose her and to bring shame upon her and to condemn her. And in all of their hypocrisy, they say to Jesus, hey, now in the law, Moses would say that we should stone this woman. But what do you say? And in verse 6, we, say, we see uh, in John chapter 8 that they said this to test him, that they may have some charge to bring against him. And then I love this. If, you're, if you've got your Bible out, underline this. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Check this out. Jesus gets down. And her accusers walk away. God has come down so that you don't have to feel trapped by your shame, but so that you can feel surrounded by the Savior. Think about this. If Jesus had not come to the temple that day, like what would that woman's fate have been? What would her story have looked like? But yet Jesus came near and Jesus has come near to you. And so I ask you, just want you to think about what would your life look like if Jesus had not come near? Like if Jesus hadn't stepped into your story, what would your life look like? Like I know for me, I would be a prideful, selfish, lustful, deadbeat dad just chasing the next thing to make me happy, not giving a care in the world about what it would cost anybody. I would be lost and alone and broken without him. See, one of the ways that we recognize the nearness of Jesus is by remembering his goodness. Remembering how he's changed us, remembering our story of transformation, remembering how he's pulled us out of the mud and into new life. John 8, verse 10, the story continues. Jesus stood up and he said to her, woman, where are they? He's like, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. 
Go and from now on sin no more. This is Jesus coming full of grace and truth. He removes the condemnation and then he calls her to turn away from sin and to turn towards him. See, Jesus was on an assignment that morning. He was on a rescue mission and Jesus is still on a rescue mission today. That mission continues and he's not afraid of your mess. He's not afraid of your sin or your failures. Quite the opposite, he's seemingly drawn to it. He's drawn to you. He's not afraid of your accusers. He knows that they're going to be there, and he is drawn to you even still. See, I think so often we have this picture that God wants us to just clean up our lives before we can come to him. But Emmanuel shows us a different picture, that God would be born in a feeding trough and into poverty, despised and rejected. See, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus has come to us in our mess to make us clean. Emmanuel is a picture that God so desperately loves us that he's willing to do anything to get his people back. Depending on the translation of the Bible you read, when you see Matthew 1.23, it may say that Emmanuel means God with us. Or if you have another translation, it may say God is with us. And to sound very smart, in the original translation of the Hebrew word Emmanuel, it says with us is God. And so many of the translations put that is in there. And I want to put an emphasis on that word is today because I don't want us to just have a Christmas season savior. I want us to have an everyday, always present mosaic of Emmanuel on our minds that doesn't cease to remember that God is with me. God is with me today. See, we need to be reminded of this. We need to remind ourselves daily that Jesus is with us. You can remind yourself every morning by waking up and by talking to God, by sitting at Jesus' feet, by soaking up his presence, by opening up his word and listening and learning from him. Some people say God doesn't speak. No, God speaks every time you open up the Bible, every time you open it up. And if we would sit at his presence, we would recognize his nearness. You can remind yourself when you see the sun rise and the sun set and you say God did that. God, you did that. The sun would not rise without you. You made that happen. You can remind yourself, you can remind your spouse or your friend daily that when things get, that get stressful, when you're tired and weary and burned out, when you're wondering what's happening next, you can say, hey, let's stop. Let's talk to God because he is near. He is close. He hears us when we call. And so rather than worrying and continuing to be anxious, I'm going to stop and let's pray right now. We need to put down our phones. We need to look up and we need to remember that God has come close. See, the world's not going to remind you that God is near. In fact, the world's trying to get you to believe the opposite, that God is far. But Emmanuel reminds us that God is close. Jesus is with us. This means that there will never be a time that he's not with you. Remember the first announcement of Jesus coming in Matthew 1.23 is, Behold, God is with us. But if you look back to Jesus' final words in Matthew 28, after he rises from the grave and before he ascends to be with his father, he's standing with his followers and he gives them what's called the Great Commission. And at the very end of this Great Commission, he says these words, Matthew 28.20, And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Behold, I am with you always. See, these are Jesus' final words spoken, which means they have some weight. They hold some weight. We always look at the final words that someone says, and we say, oh, wow, that's what they summed everything up. Jesus sums up what he's calling us to do, and then he wraps up that call, that commission, by saying, and I am with you. I am not going to leave. If you forget, behold, look, I am with you. Jesus knew the importance of knowing who is with you if you've got a great mission to accomplish. Like if you're going to go somewhere dangerous, like if you're going to go on an adventure somewhere that maybe your life might be threatened, like maybe, I don't know, Lenox Mall, (laughs) it's very important to have the right person with you. Am I right? Like everyone has at least one of those friends, you know, like that friend that if they're with you, like you're good, you're straight, you don't have a worry in the world. If they're not with you, you're like looking over your back, your shoulder, you're making sure you lock your car door, like... But if you've got that friend with you, you know everything is okay. Like for me growing up, I had this friend, Kirk. And Kirk wasn't like this massive dude. Kirk was just average-sized guy, but people didn't know he was a state champion wrestler. His dad was in the CIA. His brother trains Navy SEALs, and Kirk stays strapped at all times. You feel me? Like, like last time I saw Kirk, and I was like, what's up, dude? And we were talking and hanging out. I was like, dude, can I see, one of your new, can I see your new gun? And he was like, which one? 
And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he opens up the bed of his truck and he pulls out this like arsenal and he's like, these are my new guns. I was like, what is happening? See, I always knew if Kirk was with me, like I didn't have a worry or a care in the world. Like I knew that I was going to be all right. See, I believe that the reason why so many of us are walking through life with so much fear is that we've forgotten that God is near. See, because knowing who is with you determines how you're going to see what comes your way. And God knows that we get scared. He knows that. He knows that we worry. He knows that we get caught up in fear. Like he sees you at night when you turn the light off in your home alone and you run up the stairs as fast as you can. You know what I'm talking about? Like the boogeyman is out to get you. Like as soon as you turn the light off, you're like, "Uh uh-oh, I got to get up now. Like, And then you slam your door closed and you lock your door even though you know no one is in your house. He knows that you're scared. He knows that you turned out in that last opportunity because you were scared, because you were fearful of what it might cost you, how it might cause you to have to step out of your comfort zone. He knows that fear is one of the greatest battles of the Christian life. Post-fall, we are a bunch of scared babies. In the garden, there was no such thing as fear. Fear wasn't even around yet. But since the fall, since sin, we have been crippled by fear. Do you know what the most repeated command in the Bible is? It's do not be afraid. We see that repeated throughout scripture over and over again. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Do not fear. Joshua 1.9 is one of the most famous times. You've seen this on a lot of coffee cups, I'm sure. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will what? Be with you wherever you go. See, I believe that one of the greatest challenges that 2020 in this season of COVID has not just brought but exposed is the level of fear that we carry, the level of fear that we walk with, even within the church. We struggle with fear. And as followers of Jesus, we've got to realize that every time we let our lives be ruled by fear, we are breaking God's commands. He says it over and over again. Do not fear, which means fear is sin. It is breaking God's commands. Fear communicates a lack of trust in God. When we choose to live in fear, what we're saying is that we don't actually believe that God is near We don't actually believe that he's able. We don't actually believe that he's close, that he's with us and that he's for us. Fear forsakes the presence of God in our lives. It's like saying, God, I don't even think you're here. I'm going to choose fear instead. I'm going to be afraid. I want to sit in this fear. But knowing that Jesus is with you should change everything. Why do you think Jesus, and before he goes to be with the Father, why do you think he left these final words? I am with you. He knew that they're going to be afraid. He knew that his disciples were going to forget that he was close. He says, look, I will be with you. In Matthew 16, there's this relatable interaction with Jesus and his disciples where his disciples, um, they're going on a journey and they forgot, they realized that they had forgotten to bring food. They forgot to bring bread on their journey. And so even with Jesus right there with them, they start to like freak out. They're like, we forgot the bread. Oh, we're going to starve. We got to go get some bread. Come on, Jesus. Like, we, we need some bread. We forgot the bread. Oh, no, we're going to go hungry. Now, what's crazy is that up to this point in the story and the narrative of what's happening, the, his disciples had already seen not once, but two times, Jesus take some kids' happy meal and then turn it into enough food to feed over 5,000 and then 4,000 people. And so they're walking with Jesus, the one who has just fed all these people, and they're like, We're going to starve. Like, what? What is happening? How would they forget what just happened? Jesus is like, do you not understand? Do you not remember what I have done? See, the biggest, their biggest battle for the followers of Jesus, his disciples, was just remembering what he had done. They were prone to forget, and so aren't we. Like, they had just seen Jesus raise three people from the dead. They had just seen Jesus heal blind person after blind person, make the paralyzed walk, cast out demons, calm storms, and walk on water. And if they could just remember what Jesus had done, they would know that he was with them. And they would realize that they had nothing to fear. 
we're prone to forget. And so we've got to remember the power of Jesus is the presence of Jesus in our lives. They go hand in hand. Like you don't get the power of Jesus without the presence of Jesus. But if you realize that Jesus is present, you get his power. You see his power. See, after the cross, for three days as Jesus' body laid in the tomb, his followers thought all hope had been lost. They were filled with this fear, paralyzed by the thought that Jesus was no longer with them. But then Jesus defeats death and hell and grave. Jesus rises from the dead to show his power over all things. And then as he ascends to be with the Father, he says, I know things are going to get tough. I know you're going to get scared, but behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How would he be with them? The Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, Jesus speaking, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so how could the early church thrive in the midst of such persecution? How could they look death in the face and like Paul say, bring it on? How could they move forward even in the midst of all that was to come? It was because they knew that the power and the presence of Jesus was with them. And beyond just being with them, Jesus was now living in them through the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 4 says, For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now let me just clarify that you is for the believer, for someone that knows Jesus, has trusted in Jesus as the Lord of their lives, surrendered to him, chosen to follow him. When you know Jesus, you get Jesus in you, the Holy Spirit in you. Romans 8, 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the mosaic of Emmanuel that Jesus is not just next to you. Jesus is not just in front of you. Jesus is not just above you, beneath you, or beside you. Jesus is inside you. His power and his presence is working in you each and every day that he is never gonna leave you. There's never gonna be a moment for the believer that you ever have to wonder, is he near? No, he is closer than he can ever get, closer than you will ever realize that God is with us. This is the great theme of the Bible. The story of the Bible is God with his people. When they were in the desert for 40 years, for 40 years, he was with them by a cloud by day and a fire by night. He was with them through the sea and in the flood and the furnace, out of captivity, in the battle, in the storm, on a boat, in the waves, in prison, in persecution, sickness, and in death. He is with you. In Matthew 18, Jesus told his disciples where two or three are gathered in his name, he would be with them also. In John 14, he promises the Holy Spirit who dwells in you and will be in you, who abides with us forever. Remember, it's the first announcement of the birth of Jesus in Matthew, and it's the final word spoken by Jesus in Matthew 28. And then we see in the completion of all things in Revelation 23, one of the final verses in the last chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21, 3. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he shall be their God. Think about this. Emmanuel is the essence of heaven. God is with us. So let's be people that are marked by the presence and the power of Jesus. That there's never a time, it doesn't matter whether it's Christmas or not, there's never a time that we do not recognize the nearness of God in our lives. That when people around us start to question whether or not God is close, we remind them that Jesus moved into the neighborhood 2,000 years ago and he's living in the heart of every believer today so that we will never have to walk alone. I want to close with this, the great pastor and theologian, John Wesley. As he was breathing his last and final breaths on this earth, on his deathbed, he spoke out with a feeble voice, but with a holy triumph. And his final words were this, the best of all is God is with us. And as if anyone in the room had missed it, as if they maybe didn't hear very clearly what he said, 
reaches for one last breath to speak these words, the best of all is God is with us. That's the mosaic of Jesus as Emmanuel. The best of all, God is with us. God's come to be with you. And so will you receive him today? Let's pray. God, we're grateful that you left heaven. Jesus, that you moved into the neighborhood, into our story, no matter how messy our lives or our stories are or may seem, that Jesus, you moved in to be with us, to show us that you're enough, to prove that you have never forgotten us, that there is never a moment that you do not see us and recognize our struggle. Jesus, I'm grateful for the gift of your presence, that you would give us your Holy Spirit to live in us as our helper and friend, to walk with us, to help us navigate this life, but beyond all of that as a promise of our salvation to know that we are sealed by your Holy Spirit, that we don't have to question or wonder what will happen on the other side of eternity, but that we will be with you forever in heaven. Jesus, we're grateful for your presence. I wanna get a, a moment for anyone in the room that's here today that maybe you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You've never put your faith in him and you're questioning and wondering today, is Jesus living inside me? Do I really know Jesus? If you're here and you've never made that decision, I wanna give you an opportunity today. And so with every head bowed and eye closed in this room, I wanna just invite you to pray this prayer with me. And say, Jesus, I need you. I know that you came for me. I know that you died in my place to forgive me of my sin on the cross. And I know and believe that you rose from the grave. Jesus, I'm trusting in you as Lord of my life, believing that you are the son of God. I receive you today. I surrender to you today. God's word says that for anyone who would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead would be saved. And so if you're here and you prayed that prayer for the first time, as everyone's heads are still bowed and eyes closed, I just wanna give you an opportunity just to mark this moment, to raise your hand, to say, I made that decision. I prayed that prayer today for the first time. And so if that's you and you prayed that prayer for the first time on the count of three, I wanna invite you to raise your hand so that we can celebrate with you and so that can mark this moment. And so if that's you, just raise your hand. One, two, three. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and are receiving Jesus, amen. God sees you. He sees you in this room. Amen. 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 Jesus, we love you. We're grateful for you. We worship you here in this place. You are the reason why we gather. And so we're here to adore you, to lift high your name, believing and recognizing your nearness and your power and your presence in our lives. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Can we just celebrate that people made decisions to trust in Jesus for the first time today? Amen.